Samkhya or Sankhya Sanskrit, Sankhya Iast, Samkhya is one of the six Astika schools of Hindu philosophy. It is most related to the Yoga school of Hinduism, and it was influential on other schools of Indian philosophy. Samkhya is an enumerationist philosophy whose epistemology accepts three of six pramanas proofs, as the only reliable means of gaining knowledge. These include pratyaksa perception, anumana inference, and sabda aptavakana word testimony of reliable sources. Sometimes described as one of the rationalist schools of Indian philosophy, this ancient school's reliance on reason was exclusive but strong. Samkhya is strongly dualist. Samkhya philosophy regards the universe as consisting of two realities, purusha consciousness and prakriti matter. Jiva a living being is that state in which purusha is bonded to prakriti in some form. This fusion, state the Samkhya scholars, led to the emergence of buddhi intellect, and ahankara ego consciousness. The universe is described by this school as one created by Purusha Prakriti entities infused with various permutations and combinations of variously enumerated elements, senses, feelings, activity and mind. During the state of imbalance, one of more constituents overwhelm the others, creating a form of bondage, particularly of the mind. The end of this imbalance, bondage is called liberation, or kaivalya, by the Samkhya school, the existence of God or Supreme Being is not directly asserted, nor considered relevant by the Samkhya philosophers. Samkhya denies the final cause of Ishvara God. While the Samkhya school considers the Vedas as a reliable source of knowledge, it is an atheistic philosophy according to Paul Dusan and other scholars. A key difference between Samkhya and Yoga schools, state scholars, is that Yoga school accepts a personal, yet essentially inactive, deity, or personal god. However, Radhanath Pukhan, in the introduction to his translation of the Samkhya Karika of Isvarakarsna has argued that commentators who see the unmanifested as non-conscious make the mistake of regarding Samkhya as atheistic, though Samkhya is as much as theistic as Yoga is. Samkhya is known for its theory of gunas qualities, innate tendencies. Guna, it states, are of three types, sattva being goodness, compassion, illumination, and positivity, rajas being activity, chaos, passion, and impulsivity, potentially good or bad, and tamas being the quality of darkness, ignorance, destruction, lethargy, negativity. All matter prakriti, states Samkhya, has these three gunas, but in different proportions. The interplay of these gunas defines the character of someone or something, of nature and determines the progress of life. The Samkhya theory of gunas was widely discussed, developed and refined by various schools of Indian philosophies. Samhya's philosophical treatises also influenced the development of various theories of Hindu ethics. Etymology Samkhya, Sankhya also referred to as Sankhya, Samkhya, or Sankhya, is a Sanskrit word that, depending on the context, means, to reckon, count, enumerate, calculate, deliberate, reason, reasoning by numeric enumeration, relating to number, rational, in the context of ancient Indian philosophies, Samkhya refers to the philosophical school in Hinduism based on systematic enumeration and rational examination. <laughs> Historical development The word Samkhya means empirical or relating to numbers. Although the term had been used in the general sense of metaphysical knowledge before, in technical usage it refers to the Samkhya school of thought that evolved into a cohesive philosophical system in early centuries CE. 
The Samkhya system is called so because it enumerates 25 tattvas or true principles, and its chief object is to effect the final emancipation of the 25th tattva, i.e. the purusha or soul. Origins Some 19th and 20th century scholars suggested that Samkhya may have non-Vedic origins. Richard Garb stated in 1898, "...the origin of the Sankhya system appears in the proper light only when we understand that in those regions of India which were little influenced by Brahmanism the first attempt had been made to solve the riddles of the world and of our existence merely by means of reason." For the Sankhya philosophy is, in its essence, not only atheistic but also inimical to the Veda." Dandekar, similarly wrote in 1968, "...the origin of the Sankhya is to be traced to the pre-Vedic non-Aryan thought complex." Some scholars disagreed with this view. Surendranath Dasgupta, for example in 1922, stated, Samkhya can be traced to Upanishads such as Katha, Shvetashvatara and Maitrayani, and the extant Samkhya is a system that unites the doctrine of permanence of the Upanishads with the doctrine of momentariness of Buddhism and the doctrine of relativism of Jainism. Arthur Keith in 1925 stated, Samkhya owes its origin to the Vedic Upanishadic epic heritage as quite evident." And, "...Samkhya is most naturally derived out of the speculations in the Vedas, Brahmanas and the Upanishads." Johnston in 1937, analyzed then available Hindu and Buddhist texts for the origins of Samkhya, then wrote. The origin lay in the analysis of the individual undertaken in the Brahmanas and earliest Upanishads, at first with a view to assuring the efficacy of the sacrificial rites and later in order to discover the meaning of salvation in the religious sense and the methods of attaining it. Here, in Kashataki Upanishad and Chandogya Upanishad, the germ are to be found of two of the main ideas of classical Samkhya. Chandradar Sharma in 1960 affirmed that Samkhya in the beginning was based on the theistic absolute of Upanishads, but later on under the influence of Jaina and Buddhist thought it rejected theistic monism and was content with spiritualistic pluralism and atheistic realism. This also explains why some of the later Samkhyas, e.g. Vijnanabhiksu in the 16th century, tried to revive the earlier theism in Samkhya. More recent scholarship offers another perspective. Ruja in 2006, for example, states, Sankhya has a very long history. Its roots go deeper than textual traditions allow us to see. The ancient Buddhist Asvaosa in his Buddha Karita describes Arada Kalama, the teacher of the young Buddha ca. 420 BCE as following an archaic form of Sankhya. Anthony Warder in 2009, summarizes that Samkhya and Mimamsa schools appear to have been established before Sramana traditions in India tilde 500 BCE, and he traces Samkhya origins to be Vedic. Samkhya, writes Warder, has indeed been suggested to be non-Brahmanical and even anti-Vedic in origin, but there is no tangible evidence for that except that it is very different than most Vedic speculation, but that is itself quite inconclusive. Speculations in the direction of the Samkhya can be found in the early Upanishads. Mikkel Burley in 2012, writes Richard Garb's 19th-century view on Samhya's origin are weak and implausible. Burley states that India's religio-cultural heritage is complicated, and likely experienced a non-linear development. Samkhya is not necessarily non-Vedic nor pre-Vedic, nor a reaction to Brahmanic hegemony, states Burley. It is most plausibly, in its origins a lineage that grew and evolved from a combination of ascetic traditions and Vedic 
guru, teacher, and disciples. Burley suggests the link between Samkhya and Yoga is likely root of this evolutionary origin during the Vedic era of India. Between 1938 and 1967, two previously unknown manuscript editions of Yuktadipika ca. 600 to 700 CE were discovered and published. Yuktadipika is an ancient review by an unknown author and has emerged as the most important commentary on Samkhyakarika, itself an ancient key text of the Samkhya school. This commentary, the reconstruction of pre-Karika epistemology, and of Samkhya emanation text containing cosmology ontology from the earliest Puranas and Mokshadharma, suggest that Samkhya as a technical philosophical system existed from about the last century BCE through the early centuries of Common Era. Yuktadipika suggests that many more ancient scholars contributed to the origins of Samkhya in ancient India, than were previously known, and that Samkhya was a polemical philosophical system. However, almost nothing is preserved about the centuries when these ancient Samkhya scholars lived. Larson, Bhattacharya and Potter state that the shift of Samkhya from speculations to the normative conceptualization hints, but does not conclusively prove, that Samkhya may be the oldest of the Indian technical philosophical schools Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Buddhist ontology, one that evolved over time and influenced the technical aspects of Buddhism and Jainism. These scholars trace the earliest references to Samkhya ideas, designated as proto-Samkhya environments, to the composition of Chandogya Upanishad (tilde 800 BCE to tilde 600 BCE). Samkhya philosophy proper begins with the pre-Karika Samkhya (ca. 100 BCE to 200 CE). Topic. Founders Sage Kapila is traditionally credited as a founder of the Samkhya school. However, it is unclear in which century of 1st millennium BCE Kapila lived. Kapila appears in Rigveda, but context suggests that the word means reddish-brown color. Both Kapila as a seer and the term Samkhya appear in hymns of section 5.2 in Shvetashvatara Upanishad tilde 300 BCE, suggesting Kapila's and Samkhya philosophy's origins may predate it. Numerous other ancient Indian texts mention Kapila, for example, Bhadayana Grihasutra in Chapter 4.16.1 describes a system of rules for ascetic life credited to Kapila, called Kapila Sannyasa Vita. A 6th century CE Chinese translation and other texts consistently state Kapila as an ascetic and the founder of the school, mention a sori as the inheritor of the teaching, and a much later scholar named Pankasika as the scholar who systematized it and then helped widely disseminate its ideas. Isvarakarsna is identified in these texts as the one who summarized and simplified Samkhya theories of Pankasika, many centuries later roughly 4th or 5th century CE, in the form that was then translated into Chinese by Paramartha in the 6th century CE. Topic. Emergence as a distinct philosophy The early texts of the Vedic period, contain references to elements of Samkhya philosophy. However, the Samkhya ideas had not distilled and congealed into a distinct, complete philosophy. The early, proto-Samkhya phase was followed by early Upanishads, about 800–700 BCE, wherein ascetic spirituality and monastic sramana and yadi traditions came in vogue in India. It is in this period, state Larson, Bhattacharya and Potter, that ancient scholars combined proto-Samkhya ideas with a systematic methodology of reasoning epistemology and began distilling concepts of spiritual knowledge vidya, jnana, vivaka, making Samkhya a more emerging, comprehensive philosophy. 
These developing ideas are found in texts such as the Chandogya Upanishad, sometime about the 5th century BCE. Samkhya thought from various sources started coalescing into a distinct, complete philosophy. Philosophical texts such as the Katha Upanishad in verses 3.10-13 and 6.7-11 describe a well-defined concept of Purusha and other concepts of Samkhya, the Shvetashvatara Upanishad in chapter 6.13 describes Samkhya with yoga philosophy, and Bhagavad Gita in book 2 provides axiological implications of Samkhya, therewith providing textual evidence of Samkhyan terminology Theology and concepts. Katha Upanishad conceives the Purusha cosmic spirit, consciousness as same as the individual soul Atman, self, the Mokshadharma chapter of Shanti Parva Book of Peace in the Mahabharata epic, composed between 400 BCE to 400 CE, explains Samkhya ideas along with other extant philosophies, and then lists numerous scholars in recognition of their philosophical contributions to various Indian traditions, and their Therein at least three Samkhya scholars can be recognized, Kapila, Asori and Pankasika. The twelfth chapter of the Buddhist text Buddhakarita suggests Samkhya philosophical tools of reliable reasoning were well formed by about 5th century BCE. Samkhya and Yoga are mentioned together for first time in Chapter 6.13 of the Shvetashvatara Upanishad, as Samkhya Yoga Adhigamya literally to be understood by proper reasoning and spiritual discipline." Bhagavad Gita identifies Samkhya with understanding or knowledge. The three gunas are also mentioned in the Gita, though they are not used in the same sense as in classical Samkhya. The Gita integrates Samkhya thought with the devotion bhakti of theistic schools and the impersonal Brahman of Vedanta, according to Ruja, about 2000 years ago. Sankhya became the representative philosophy of Hindu thought in Hindu circles, influencing all strands of the Hindu tradition and Hindu texts. Topic: <inaudible> Vedic influences. The ideas that were developed and assimilated into the classical Samkhya text, the Sankhyakarika, are visible in earlier Hindu scriptures such as the Vedas, the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. The earliest mention of dualism is in the Rigveda, a text that was compiled in the 2nd millennium BCE, in various chapters. At a mythical level, dualism is found in the Indravritra myth of Chapter 1.32 of the Rigveda. Enumeration, the etymological root of the word Samkhya, is found in numerous chapters of the Rigveda, such as 1.164, 10.90 and 10.129. Larson, Bhattacharya and Potter state that the likely roots of philosophical premises, spirit-matter dualism, meditative themes and religious cosmology in Samkhya philosophy are in the hymns of 1.164 and 10.129 hymns. However these hymns present only the outline of ideas, not specific Samkhya theories and these theories developed in a much later period. The riddle hymns of the Rigveda, famous for their numerous enumerations, structural language symmetry within the verses and the chapter, enigmatic word play with anagrams that symbolically portray parallelism in rituals and the cosmos, nature and the inner life of man. This hymn includes enumeration counting, as well as a series of dual concepts cited by early Upanishads. For example, the hymns 1.164.2-1.164-3 mention 7 multiple times, which in the context of other chapters of Rigveda have been interpreted as referring to both seven priests at a ritual and seven constellations in the sky. The entire hymn is a riddle that paints a ritual as well as the sun, moon, earth, three seasons, the transitory nature of living beings, the passage of time and spirit. The chapter 1.164 asks a number of metaphysical questions, such as 
What is the one in the form of the unborn that created the six realms of the world? Dualistic philosophical speculations then follow in Chapter 1.164 of the Rigveda, particularly in the well studied Allegory of Two Birds. Him 1.164.2021.164.22, a hymn that is referred to in the Mandaka Upanishad and other texts. The two birds in this hymn have been interpreted to mean various forms of dualism, the sun and the moon, the two seekers of different kinds of knowledge, and the body and the Atman. The emphasis of duality between existence sat and non-existence in the Nasadiya Sukta of the Rigveda is similar to the Vyakta-Avyakta manifest -unmanifest polarity in Samkhya. The hymns about Purusha may also have influenced Samkhya. The Samkhya notion of Buddhi or Mahat is similar to the notion of Haranyagarbha, which appears in both the Rigveda and the Shvetashvatara Upanishad. Upanishadic influences The oldest of the major Upanishads c. 900 BCE contains speculations along the lines of classical Samkhya philosophy. The concept of Ahamkara in Samkhya can be traced back to the notion of Ahamkara in chapters 1.2 and 1.4 of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad and chapter 7.25 of the Chandogya Upanishad. Satkaryavada, the theory of causation in Samkhya, can be traced to the verses in 6th chapter which emphasize the primacy of Sat being and describe creation from it. The idea that the three gunas or attributes influence creation is found in both Chandogya and Shvetashvatara Upanishads. Upanishadic sages Yajnavalka and Yudhalaka Aruni developed the idea that pure consciousness was the innermost essence of a human being. The Purusha of Samkhya could have evolved from this idea. The enumeration of tattvas in Samkhya is also found in Taittiriya Upanishad, Aitareya Upanishad and Yajnavalka Maitri dialogue in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. <inaudible> <inaudible> Buddhist and Jainist influences Buddhism and Jainism had developed in eastern India by the 5th century BCE. It is probable that these schools of thought and the earliest schools of Samkhya influenced each other. A prominent similarity between Buddhism and Samkhya is the greater emphasis on suffering dukkha as the foundation for their respective soteriological theories, than other Indian philosophies. However, suffering appears central to Samkhya in its later literature, which suggests a likely Buddhism influence. Alade, however, presents the alternate theory that Samkhya and Buddhism developed their soteriological theories over time, benefiting from their mutual influence. Likewise, the Jain doctrine of plurality of individual souls jiva, could have influenced the concept of multiple purushas in Samkhya. However Hermann Jacobi, an Indologist, thinks that there is little reason to assume that Samkhya notion of Purushas was solely dependent on the notion of Jiva in Jainism. It is more likely, that Samkhya was molded by many ancient theories of soul in various Vedic and non-Vedic schools. Larson, Bhattacharya and Potter state it to be likely that early Samkhya doctrines found in oldest Upanishads approximately 700-800 BCE provided the contextual foundations and influenced Buddhist and Jaina doctrines, and these became contemporaneous, sibling intellectual movements with Samkhya and other schools of Hindu philosophy. This is evidenced, for example, by the references to Samkhya in ancient and medieval era Jaina literature. Topic: <laughs> Source material. Topic: <laughs> 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 Texts. 
The earliest surviving authoritative text on classical Samkhya philosophy is the Samkhya Karika c. 200 CE or 350 to 450 CE of Isvarakarsna. There were probably other texts in early centuries CE, however none of them are available today. Isvarakarsna in his Karika describes a succession of the disciples from Kapila, through Asori and Pankasika to himself. The text also refers to an earlier work of Samkhya philosophy called Sastitantra science of 60 topics which is now lost. The text was imported and translated into Chinese about the middle of the 6th century CE. The records of Al-Biruni, the Persian visitor to India in the early 11th century, suggests Samkhya Karika was an established and definitive text in India in his times. Samkhya Karika includes distilled statements on epistemology, metaphysics and soteriology of the Samkhya school. For example, the 4th to 6th verses of the text states it epistemic premises. Perception, inference and right affirmation are admitted to be threefold proof, for they are by all acknowledged, and comprise every mode of demonstration. It is from proof that belief of that which is to be proven results. Perception is ascertainment of particular objects. Inference, which is of three sorts, premises an argument, and deduces that which is argued by it. Right affirmation is true revelation apta vikana and sruti, testimony of reliable source and the Vedas. Sensible objects become known by perception, but it is by inference or reasoning that acquaintance with things transcending the senses is obtained. A truth which is neither to be directly perceived, nor to be inferred from reasoning, is deduced from apta vikana and sruti. The most popular commentary on the Samkhyakarika was the Gaudapada Bhasya attributed to Gaudapada, the proponent of Advaita Vedanta school of philosophy. Richard King, professor of religious studies, thinks it is unlikely that Gaudapada could have authored both texts, given the differences between the two philosophies. Other important commentaries on the Karika were Yuktadipika c. 6th century CE and Vikaspati's Samkhyadatvakomudi c. 10th century CE the Samkhyapravakana Sutra c. 14th century CE renewed interest in Samkhya in the medieval era. It is considered the second most important work of Samkhya after the Karika. Commentaries on this text were written by Aniruddha Samkhya Sutravarti c. 15th century CE, Vijñānanheksu Samkhya Pravakana Bhasya, c. 16th century CE, Mahadeva Vertisara, c. 17th century CE, and Nagasa Lagasamkhya Sutravarti. According to Surendranath Dasgupta, scholar of Indian philosophy, Sharaka Samhita, an ancient Indian medical treatise, also contains thoughts from an early Samkhya school. Other sources The 13th century text Sarvadarshanasangraha contains 16 chapters, each devoted to a separate school of Indian philosophy. The 13th chapter in this book contains a description of the Samkhya philosophy. Lost textual references In his studies in Samkhya philosophy, K. C. Bhattacharya writes, much of Samkhya literature appears to have been lost, and there seems to be no continuity of tradition from ancient times to the age of the commentators. The interpretation of all ancient systems requires a constructive effort, but, while in the case of some systems where we have a large volume of literature and a continuity of tradition, the construction is mainly of the nature of translation of ideas into modern concepts, here in Samkhya the construction at many places involves supplying of missing links from one's imagination. It is risky work, but unless one does it one cannot be said to understand Samkhya as a philosophy. 
It is a task that one is obliged to undertake. It is a fascinating task because Samkhya is a bold constructive philosophy. Topic. Philosophy Topic. Epistemology Samkhya considered pratyaksa or dhyarstam direct sense perception, anamana inference, and sabda or aptavakana verbal testimony of the sages or shastras to be the only valid means of knowledge or pramana. Unlike some other schools, Samkhya did not consider the following three pramanas to be epistemically proper: upamana (comparison and analogy), arthapati (postulation, deriving from circumstances), or anupalabdhi (non-perception, negative, cognitive proof). Pratyaksa (pratyaksa means perception). It is of two types in Hindu texts: external and internal. External perception is described as that arising from the interaction of five senses and worldly objects, while internal perception is described by this school as that of inner sense, the mind. The ancient and medieval Indian texts identify four requirements for correct perception, indriyarthasanikarsa direct experience by one's sensory organs with the object, whatever is being studied, aviapadesya non-verbal, correct perception is not through hearsay, according to ancient Indian scholars, where one's sensory organ relies on accepting or rejecting someone else's perception, avyabhakara does not wander, correct perception does not change nor is it the result of deception because one's sensory organ or means of observation is drifting defective suspect and vyavasayat maka definite correct perception excludes judgments of doubt either because of one's failure to observe all the details or because one is mixing inference with observation and observing what one wants to observe or not observing what one does not want to observe some ancient scholars proposed unusual perception as pramana and called it internal perception a proposal contested by other indian scholars the internal perception concepts included pratibha intuition samanyalaksana pratyaksa a form of induction from perceived specifics to a universal and nianalaksana pratyaksa a form of perception of prior processes and previous states of a topic of study by observing its current state Further, some schools considered and refined rules of accepting uncertain knowledge from pratyaksa pranama, so as to contrast nirnaya definite judgment, conclusion from anadyavasaya indefinite judgment. Anamana Anamana means inference. It is described as reaching a new conclusion and truth from one or more observations and previous truths by applying reason. Observing smoke and inferring fire is an example of anamana. In all except one Hindu philosophies, this is a valid and useful means to knowledge. The method of inference is explained by Indian texts as consisting of three parts, pratijna hypothesis, hichu a reason, and durshtanta examples. The hypothesis must further be broken down into two parts, state the ancient Indian scholars, sadhya that idea which needs to proven or disproven and paksha the object on which the sadhya is predicated. The inference is conditionally true if sapaksha positive examples as evidence are present, and if vipaksha negative examples as counter evidence are absent. For rigor, the Indian philosophies also state further epistemic steps. For example, they demand vyapti, the requirement that the hichu reason must necessarily and separately account for the inference in all cases, in both sapaksha and vipaksha. A conditionally proven hypothesis is called a nigamana conclusion. Sabda Sabda means relying on word, testimony of past or present reliable experts. Hirayana explains Sabda Pramana as a concept which means reliable expert testimony. 
The schools which consider it epistemically valid suggest that a human being needs to know numerous facts, and with the limited time and energy available, he can learn only a fraction of those facts and truths directly. He must cooperate with others to rapidly acquire and share knowledge and thereby enrich each other's lives. This means of gaining proper knowledge is either spoken or written, but through sabda words. The reliability of the source is important, and legitimate knowledge can only come from the sabda of reliable sources. The disagreement between the schools has been on how to establish reliability. Some schools, such as Karvaka, state that this is never possible, and therefore sabda is not a proper pramana. Other schools debate means to establish reliability. Topic. Dualism While Western philosophical traditions, as exemplified by Descartes, equate mind with the conscious self and theorize on consciousness on the basis of mind-body dualism, Samkhya provides an alternate viewpoint, intimately related to substance dualism, by drawing a metaphysical line between consciousness and matter. Where matter includes both body and mind, the Samkhya system espouses dualism between consciousness and matter by postulating two irreducible, innate and independent realities, Purusha and Prakriti. While the Prakriti is a single entity, the Samkhya admits a plurality of the Purusas in this world. Unintelligent, unmanifest, uncaused, ever active, imperceptible and eternal prakriti is alone the final source of the world of objects which is implicitly and potentially contained in its bosom. The purusha is considered as the conscious principle, a passive enjoyer bokta, and the prakriti as the enjoyed bogya. Samkhya believes that the Purusha cannot be regarded as the source of inanimate world, because an intelligent principle cannot transform itself into the unconscious world. It is a pluralistic spiritualism, atheistic realism and uncompromising dualism. Purusha Purusha is the transcendental self or pure consciousness. It is absolute, independent, free, imperceptible, unknowable through other agencies, above any experience by mind or senses and beyond any words or explanations. It remains pure, non-attributive consciousness. Purusha is neither produced nor does it produce. It is held that unlike Advaita Vedanta and like Purva Mimamsa, Samkhya believes in plurality of the Purusas. Prakirti Prakirti is the first cause of the manifest material universe—of everything except the Purusha. Prakriti accounts for whatever is physical, both mind and matter cum energy or force. Since it is the first principle tattva of the universe, it is called the pradhana, but, as it is the unconscious and unintelligent principle, it is also called the jada. It is composed of three essential characteristics trigunas. These are sattva, poise, fineness, lightness, illumination, and joy. Rajas, dynamism, activity, excitation, and pain. Tamas, inertia, coarseness, heaviness, obstruction, and sloth. All physical events are considered to be manifestations of the evolution of prakriti, or primal nature, from which all physical bodies are derived. Each sentient being or jiva is a fusion of purusha and prakriti, whose soul, purusha, is limitless and unrestricted by its physical body. Samsara or bondage arises when the Purusha does not have the discriminate knowledge and so is misled as to its own identity, confusing itself with the ego, ahamkara, which is actually an attribute of prakriti. The spirit is liberated when the discriminate knowledge of the difference between conscious Purusha and unconscious prakriti is realized by the Purusha. 
The unconscious primordial materiality, Prakirti, contains 23 components including intellect, buddhi, mahat, ego, ahamkara, and mind. Manas. The intellect, mind, and ego are all seen as forms of unconscious matter. Thought processes and mental events are conscious only to the extent they receive illumination from Purusha. In Samkhya, consciousness is compared to light which illuminates the material configurations or shapes assumed by the mind. So intellect, after receiving cognitive structures form the mind and illumination from pure consciousness, creates thought structures that appear to be conscious. Ahamkara, the ego or the phenomenal self, appropriates all mental experiences to itself and thus, personalizes the objective activities of mind and intellect by assuming possession of them. But consciousness is itself independent of the thought structures it illuminates. By including mind in the realm of matter, Samkhya avoids one of the most serious pitfalls of Cartesian dualism, the violation of physical conservation laws. Because mind is an evolute of matter, mental events are granted causal efficacy and are therefore able to initiate bodily motions. Evolution The idea of evolution in Samkhya revolves around the interaction of Prakirti and Purusha. Prakirti remains unmanifested as long as the three gunas are in equilibrium. This equilibrium of the gunas is disturbed when Prakirti comes into proximity with consciousness or Purusha. The disequilibrium of the gunas triggers an evolution that leads to the manifestation of the world from an unmanifested Prakirti. The metaphor of movement of iron in the proximity of a magnet is used to describe this process. Some evolutes of prakriti can cause further evolution and are labeled evolvents. For example, intellect, while itself created out of prakriti, causes the evolution of ego sense or ahamkara and is therefore an evolvent. While other evolutes, like the five elements, do not cause further evolution. It is important to note that an evolvent is defined as a principle which behaves as the material cause for the evolution of another principle. So, in definition, while the five elements are the material cause of all living beings, they cannot be called evolvents because living beings are not separate from the five elements in essence. The intellect is the first evolute of Prakirti and is called Mahat or the Great One. It causes the evolution of ego sense or self-consciousness. Evolution from self-consciousness is affected by the dominance of gunas. So dominance of sattva causes the evolution of the five organs of perception, five organs of action and the mind. Dominance of tamas triggers the evolution of five subtle elements sound, touch, sight, taste, smell from self-consciousness. These five subtle elements are themselves evolvents and cause the creation of the five gross elements space, air, fire, water and earth. Rajas is cause of action in the evolutes. Purusha is pure consciousness absolute, eternal and subject to no change. It is neither a product of evolution, nor the cause of any evolute. Evolution in Samkhya is thought to be purposeful. The two primary purposes of evolution of Prakirti are the enjoyment and the liberation of Purusha. The 23 evolutes of Prakirti are categorized as follows. <inaudible> liberation or Moksha Samkhya school considers moksha as a natural quest of every soul. The Samkhyakarika states, Samkhya regards ignorance avidya as the root cause of suffering and bondage samsara. Samkhya states that the way out of this suffering is through knowledge vivaka. Moksha liberation, states Samkhya school, results from knowing the difference between prakirti avyakta -vyakta and purusha jainya. Purusha, the eternal pure consciousness, due to ignorance, identifies itself with products of prakirti such as intellect buddhi, and ego ahamkara. This results in endless transmigration and suffering. 
However, once the realization arises that Purusha is distinct from Prakriti, is more than empirical ego, and that Purusha is deepest conscious self within, the self gains isolation kaivalya, and freedom moksha. .Other forms of Samkhya teach that moksha is attained by one's own development of the higher faculties of discrimination achieved by meditation and other yogic practices. Moksha is described by Samkhya scholars as a state of liberation, where sattva guna predominates. Causality The Samkhya system is based on Satkarya Vada or the theory of causation. According to Satkaryavada, the effect is pre-existent in the cause. There is only an apparent or illusory change in the makeup of the cause and not a material one, when it becomes effect. Since, effects cannot come from nothing, the original cause or ground of everything is seen as prakriti. More specifically, Samkhya system follows the prakriti purinama vada. Purinama denotes that the effect is a real transformation of the cause. The cause under consideration here is prakriti or more precisely mula prakriti primordial matter. The Samkhya system is therefore an exponent of an evolutionary theory of matter beginning with primordial matter. In evolution, prakriti is transformed and differentiated into multiplicity of objects. Evolution is followed by dissolution. In dissolution the physical existence, all the worldly objects mingle back into prakriti, which now remains as the indifferentiated, primordial substance. This is how the cycles of evolution and dissolution follow each other. But this theory is very different from the modern theories of science in the sense that prakriti evolves for each jiva separately, giving individual bodies and minds to each and after liberation these elements of prakriti merges into the mula prakriti. Another uniqueness of Samkhya is that not only physical entities but even mind, ego and intelligence are regarded as forms of unconsciousness, quite distinct from pure consciousness. Samkhya theorizes that prakriti is the source of the perceived world of becoming. It is pure potentiality that evolves itself successively into 24 tattvas or principles. The evolution itself is possible because prakriti is always in a state of tension among its constituent strands or gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. In a state of equilibrium of three gunas, when the three together are one, unmanifest prakriti which is unknowable. A guna is an entity that can change, either increase or decrease, therefore, pure consciousness is called nirguna or without any modification. The evolution obeys causality relationships, with primal nature itself being the material cause of all physical creation. The cause and effect theory of Samkhya is called Satkarya Vada, theory of existent causes, and holds that nothing can really be created from or destroyed into nothingness. All evolution is simply the transformation of primal nature from one form to another. Samkhya cosmology describes how life emerges in the universe. The relationship between Purusha and Prakriti is crucial to Patanjali's yoga system. The strands of Samkhya thought can be traced back to the Vedic speculation of creation. It is also frequently mentioned in the Mahabharata and Yogavajishta. Atheism Samkhya accepts the notion of higher selves or perfected beings but rejects the notion of God. Classical Samkhya argues against the existence of God on metaphysical grounds. Samkhya theorists argue that an unchanging God cannot be the source of an ever-changing world and that God was only a necessary metaphysical assumption demanded by circumstances. The sutras of Samkhya have no explicit role for a separate God distinct from the Purusha. Such a distinct God is inconceivable and self-contradictory and some commentaries speak plainly on this subject. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Arguments against Ishvara's existence. According to Sinha, the following arguments were given by the Samkhya philosophers against the idea of an eternal, self-caused, creator God. If the existence of karma is assumed, the proposition of God as a moral governor of the universe is unnecessary. For, if God enforces the consequences of actions then he can do so without karma. If however, he is assumed to be within the law of karma, then karma itself would be the giver of consequences and there would be no need of a god. Even if karma is denied, god still cannot be the enforcer of consequences. Because the motives of an enforcer god would be either egoistic or altruistic. Now, God's motives cannot be assumed to be altruistic because an altruistic God would not create a world so full of suffering. If his motives are assumed to be egoistic, then God must be thought to have desire, as agency or authority cannot be established in the absence of desire. However, assuming that God has desire would contradict God's eternal freedom which necessitates no compulsion in actions. Moreover, desire, according to Samkhya, is an attribute of prakriti and cannot be thought to grow in God. The testimony of the Vedas, according to Samkhya, also confirms this notion. Despite arguments to the contrary, if God is still assumed to contain unfulfilled desires, this would cause him to suffer pain and other similar human experiences. Such a worldly god would be no better than Samhya's notion of higher self. Furthermore, there is no proof of the existence of God. He is not the object of perception, there exists no general proposition that can prove him by inference and the testimony of the Vedas speak of Prakriti as the origin of the world, not God. Therefore, Samkhya maintained that the various cosmological, ontological and teleological arguments could not prove God. Topic. Textual references The Sankhya Tattva Kamudi commenting on Karika 57 argues that a perfect god can have no need to create a world for himself and if god's motive is kindness for others, Samkhya questions whether it is reasonable to call into existence beings who while non-existent had no suffering. The Samkhya Pravakana Sutra in verse No. 1.92 directly states that existence of Ishvara god is unproved. Hence there is no philosophical place for a creationist god in this system. It is also argued by commentators of this text that the existence of Ishvara cannot be proved and hence cannot be admitted to exist. These commentaries of Samkhya postulate that a benevolent deity ought to create only happy creatures, not a mixed world like the real world. A majority of modern academic scholars are a view that the concept of Ishvara was incorporated into the Nirishvara atheistic Samkhya viewpoint only after it became associated with the Yoga, the Pasupada and the Bhagavata schools of philosophy. This theistic Samkhya philosophy is described in the Mahabharata, the Puranas and the Bhagavad Gita. Topic. Reception The Advaita Vedanta philosopher Adi Shankara called Samkhya as the principal opponent of the Vedanta. He criticized the Samkhya view that the cause of the universe is the unintelligent prakruti According to Shankara, the intelligent Brahman only can be such a cause. He considered Samkhya philosophy as propounded in Samkhya Karika to be inconsistent with the teachings in the Vedas, and considered the dualism in Samkhya to be non-Vedic. In contrast, ancient Samkhya philosophers in India claimed Vedic authority for their views. Topic: <laughs> Influence on other schools. Topic. On Indian philosophies 
With the publication of previously unknown editions of Euctidipica about mid-20th century, scholars have suggested what they call as a tempting hypothesis, but uncertain, that Samkhya tradition may be the oldest of the Indian technical philosophical schools Nyaya, Vaisheshika. The Vaisheshika atomism, Nyaya epistemology may all have roots in the early Samkhya school of thought, but these schools likely developed in parallel with an evolving Samkhya tradition, as sibling intellectual movements. Topic. On yoga The yoga school derives its ontology and epistemology from Samkhya and adds to it the concept of Isvara. However, scholarly opinion on the actual relationship between yoga and Samkhya is divided. While Jakob Wilhelm Hauer and Georg Feuerstein believe that yoga was a tradition common to many Indian schools and its association with Samkhya was artificially foisted upon it by commentators such as Vyasa. Johannes Bronckhorst and Eric Frauwallner think that yoga never had a philosophical system separate from Samkhya. Bronckhorst further adds that the first mention of yoga as a separate school of thought is no earlier than Sankara's c. 788–820 CE Brahmasutrabhasya. On Tantra The dualistic metaphysics of various tantric traditions illustrates the strong influence of Samkhya on Tantra. Shaiva Siddhanta was identical to Samkhya in its philosophical approach, barring the addition of a transcendent theistic reality. Knut A. Jacobson, professor of religious studies, notes the influence of Samkhya on Shravaishnavism. According to him, this tantric system borrows the abstract dualism of Samkhya and modifies it into a personified male-female dualism of Vishnu and Sri Lakshmi. Dasgupta speculates that the tantric image of a wild Kali standing on a slumbering Shiva was inspired from the Samkhyan conception of Prakriti as a dynamic agent and Purusha as a passive witness. However, Samkhya and Tantra differed in their view on liberation. While Tantra sought to unite the male and female ontological realities, Samkhya held a withdrawal of consciousness from matter as the ultimate goal. According to Bagchi, the Samkhya Karika in Karika 70 identifies Samkhya as a Tantra, and its philosophy was one of the main influences both on the rise of the Tantras as a body of literature, as well as Tantra Sadhana. Topic. See also Advaita Vedanta of Adi Shankara Darshanas Kyadivada Linga Sarira Ratha Kalpana Notes <laughs> <laughs>